We are excited to have uh, the San Francisco Giants here talking about you know, how they're leveraging AI and I'll call workflow automation um, to really uh, grow the yield out of their content assets. Um, so we're going to kind of talk through what that project was. Um, we're also here by their SI partner who helped facilitate a lot of this workflow um, opportunities have been a long-standing partner of the San Francisco Giants for a while. Uh, Sid Napstad um, from Cutting Edge, and I apologize, this is Paul Hodges the third from the San Francisco Giants, heads up uh, productions. So, you know, with that, we'll kick in. Um, we know we have a, a short period of time here, um, but I think the you know, high level last year there was a ton of talk about you know AI machine learning. Um, we're going to try to really drill in on you know, how it's being practically used in some very specific use cases by the San Francisco, San Francisco Giants, and hopefully this will give some insight on how this may be applicable to your businesses. So with that, why don't we do a little bit of uh, brief background on each other? You want to start, Sig? I know your background. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey everybody, my name is Sig Napsid. I'm the CTO of Alt Systems. Uh, first of all, full disclosure, Paul and I are recovering from really bad cold, so if we're a little stopped up here or coughing, please forgive us. But uh, for those of you that don't know Alt Systems, we're LA's premier provider, um, I'm well now, <laughs> of uh, you know uh, color finishing, DI, networking, storage solutions. And earlier this year, we merged with Cutting Edge, headquartered out of San Francisco. And Cutting Edge has courier expertise in file-based workflows, and it's been an honor to work with Paul Hodges and his team for over the last decade as their system integrator and file-based workflow provider. Paul, you want to tell us a little bit more about sure, you? Sure, yeah. Paul Hodges, so Vice President of SFG Productions. So that's our uh, in-house video team. So we, we fill content, build content for our social platforms as well as our, our in-stadium uh, video board. Um, I started with the Giants as an intern in 2000. Um, and left in 2014 to go to the Warriors, started Warriors Studio over there, got a championship there, and then left and came back to the Giants in 2016. And that's when we started this project that we're about to uh, present to you guys in 2017. So it's been, it's been a, a two-year project so far for us. And uh, I'm Ryan Steelberg. I'm president of Veritone. Um, we are a data and analytics driven by AI shop. We service about a couple hundred different partners in all kind of areas of media and entertainment from studios to professional sports teams. And we also have a significant practice in public safety and justice, um, trying to catch bad guys with a lot of our tech. Um, so we're excited to be a, just a partner, I'll call a powerful tool set to really enable what these guys have ideated and, and sort of put together here. So thanks for uh, hosting us today. All right, let's continue. Um, you wanna get a little, little. Yeah, so, so to paint a picture for you guys, um, in that first go around with the Giants, we, um, and this isn't very unique, like we have a lot of tapes that are sitting in a storage locker somewhere. And it, it, every baseball, much like sports in general, is a, a nostalgic game. And so you're, you're always trying to, to play on that emotion and, and remembering the past. And, and as editors and content creators, you're always trying to find some new nugget that has been locked away and you're trying to unlock that and uncover that. Whoops. Check. And um, so we, we've always been putting a tape in the, in the tape machine, digitizing. And we started doing that, I think, in, in 2007. And, um, and it got to a point where it, it, was, it was a waste of time. In 2017, what was unique is, is the stuff has been sitting there deterior, deteriorating for a long time. And um, the, the, the picture, we had we had an, an archivist that saved this material, these tapes back in the 90s. It was all put in boxes, it was about to go to the trash can, and she went out, saved it, pulled all the tapes back. Um, and it's been sitting in storage lockers uh, around the Bay Area, in pods and U-Haul storage places uh, for the last, I mean, I guess since probably she saved it. And it, it was in, in a dire situation, so it was more or less we needed to save this content or it was gonna be gone forever. So as you can look up there, we had a 60 year archive with thousands of hours of footage. And um, you know, we, I'll, I'll give you another uh, example. We, when Will Clark, we were trying to celebrate Will Clark uh, a couple of years ago, and we were going through a file base, uh, um, what was that, uh, data? Not Excel, but uh, FileMaker Pro. Our, our archivist had a FileMaker Pro. She had written all the, the, the material down from the spines. 
and uh, we were looking for Will Clark footage. And there was a tape that said Goodwill. Figured, hey, this is Goodwill footage. Let's, let's grab it. And it turned out to be a PSA for the Goodwill. So that, that was the kind of the data, that was our, our trouble that we were working with. And uh, we realized we needed to digitize this stuff. And at that time, in 2017, when AI was just kind of a buzzword, we had um, planned essentially to have 13 interns maybe for an entire year, 40 hours a week, sit there and log this stuff. But I think the next slide is the video, right? That we, I have a video for you that kind of like tells this whole project. Hamilton with the ball moving away from him, takes it down. History. The funny thing about history is that no one sees it coming. No one knows when that pivotal moment is walking to the plate or taking the mound. These are the unforgettable moments that we all know. The stories that have shaped Giants history. I think baseball, more than any other sport, brings us back to our childhood. We spent a lot of time uh, talking about our former players, and I think fans appreciate that part of our business. So saving that history, I think, is really important to us, and I think our fans will appreciate it in the future. One of the great differentiators are that we've been around 140 years. To see what our parents and grandparents saw and then hand them down to our children and grandchildren, we're caretakers of a franchise that, you know, we believe will be around forever, and it's incumbent on us to hand these images down to future generations. Walton at first, Bedrosian throws to Sandberg, and the pitch is grounded to second base. Thompson has it, throws to first, it's over! 27 years of waiting have come to an end. The Giants have won the pennant. What is in those tapes is sort of what is our DNA. It is who we are. A lot of teams don't have the history that we do, and we are so fortunate to have our history, and now to be able to show it better than we ever have been before is so important. This is a game that you hand now from generation to generation, and that's part of what this project is all about. It's really taking the memories of the past and telling that story to new fans. And to, for me personally, that's the most exciting part of this. Now the 2-2 pitch to McCovey. Drive the deep left field. Back goes Crawford. Still going back. It's gone! A grand slam home run! McCovey with a 14th grand slam of his major league career. A legendary home run heard over the radio. An impossible catch captured on a single reel of film. Or a final out broadcast into our homes. These stories are our legacy. A legacy that, until recently, had become increasingly difficult to preserve. When we were accumulating all these tapes, we'd often look at this wall of videotape and say, what in the heck are we gonna do with all this tape? But the fact that all that, all those games, interviews that we did with early Giants Vision, all being saved, it's pretty remarkable. We've seen bits and pieces, we've seen highlights over the years from just one game here from the 80s, one game here from the 70s, but to have all of those games and all of those highlights in the tapes, I think we can't even imagine what we're gonna find. What else, Francisco? Are you looking forward to the last day here in Dodger Stadium and going back to your native land of Puerto Rico? Yeah, so make sure you swing the first pitch so we can get out of here early. And see you later. <laughs> he said, make sure you swing at the first pitch, get out of here early, and have a two-hour game. It's the ability to show the personality of a lot of our players and a lot of the personalities in this game, and what they were like when they weren't on the field, or who our announcers were. And there's just there's so much more that makes up the Giants brand. To be able to preserve that um, is just critical. You know, Tom, a lot of things have happened in my life, a lot of great things. I think this is one of the happiest moments, you know, to be managing in the World Series and to be the manager of this great ball club. For decades, thousands of hours of Giants media loomed around the Bay Area and the country, ticking closer to their expiration dates. The organization's mission to digitize every second of it is a once-in-a-lifetime effort. The Legacy Project. So, yeah. That's the, that's the project in a, in a quick four-minute summary.
So um, as you saw in there, there were tape storage lockers. We had three quarter inch, we had, we had film, we had everything. Uh, initially we thought we had 11,000 assets and we ended up having 16,000 assets. Um, there are a lot of clips that, you, that we showed in this video that we had never seen before. And, and as you know, I had been there since 2000. There's a lot of clips I'd never even seen before. The cool part is there were a lot of uh, pieces of content that, that essentially had been transferred from film to beta to SD that we then upconverted to HD down the road. So there was stuff that uh, I was seeing now in, in 2K, 4K resolution that I had never seen before. So th there was a, a lot of cool discovery. And, and I guess segue back to why we're here, this project became pretty enormous. And as I said before, we, we thought we could log it ourselves in a year and have interns do it. But um, we realized that this was a pretty massive project, which is why we have Veritone and, and cutting edge alt systems here, uh, because it definitely supported this big idea in getting it off the ground. So I yeah, I mean, I'll just, I mean, a couple things relative to, you know, I indexing them. Obviously, we were able to take advantage of the, you know the how cheap storage and compute have gotten right so the benefit of big you know cloud storage very cost effective storage um, you know, it sort of laid the groundwork for us to do this um, ai is really fascinating with the you know how it advanced it's gotten how accurate it's gotten that if you look at this fit footage i mean th a lot of the faces aren't that clear so if you're thinking about just running facial detection may not may, may not be good enough but if i can combine facial with ocr Look, analyzing the number or the logos on the screen or different elements, you can start to look at it through different vectors and, and be able to find exactly what you're looking for. Um, so we work with, with like CBS News and their entire archive. I mean, it's a huge, goes back to the, you know, before the Apollo moon landing. Um, but it's also current content. We were talking about it earlier and that w again, because digital is so cost effective, leave the cameras running. Right? You never know what fans are going to be really interested in. So it's no longer just about what's the clean feed after it's going over the air, but, the, but a lot of the, I would say, footage that's being produced um, like at the US Open, which is a client of ours. I mean, all that potential content, which you thought you would just put on the editor floor, could be fodder for great fan engagement. So again, AI, we, we view as just in a cost-effective tool that allows you to harvest this content and, and make it readily available. So he's going to, so yeah, so Sig's going to walk through the, the workflow itself um, and go through the details. So all the ankle bones and leg bones. <coughs> Paul, is it true, though, that somebody opened up a tin of film and found the 1935 World Series? Yes, Sig, how did you know that? <laughs> that wasn't scripted, that's true. So Yeah, there were a lot of, yeah. there were a lot of things we uncovered, uncovered that were pretty cool. Yeah, that's right. So one of the things I'm passionate about are workflows, and um, <clears throat> they're kind of the way that, as an systems integrator, we get to be creative, if you will. And so um, instead of using words, we get to use you know, manufacturers and tools and technology to kind of tell the story. And so when Paul asks us to kind of repurpose um, you know, and, and preserve, actually, all of their assets for 60 years, we were able to leverage our history and our experience and all the manufacturers to kind of create a workflow. So I'm just going to walk you, I won't get too out in the weeds here, but I want to walk you through a bit of, of how all of this actually works. So, uh, first of all, we have a lot of different sources. You know, boy, 16,000 tapes, about every format you can possibly imagine. Uh, formats that were probably invented before some of you were born. Um, but in this case, we're using film is going to be uh, scanned up to 2K. And uh, video will be digitized at 1080, ProRes HQ. That's our codec of choice. And what happens then, this is all done at Iron Mountain. So we did a bunch of research and work on behalf of the Giants to discover the best vendor to digitize and preserve all of these assets, we came up with Iron Mountain. And so Iron Mountain will do this work for us and ultimately will ship to the stadium, for the Giants stadium, um, LTO7 tapes that have the, the data on them. And they'll also create a FileMaker database with the tape and the spline name and all that sort of stuff that in a moment we'll integrate with Veritone. And essentially what happens from there, that comes on-prem, and then it gets loaded into a big ro robotic tape library called a Spectrologic T950. Holds about 920 of these tapes. Each one of these tapes can hold about six terabytes of data, right? So we're talking about a lot of data here. And I think the scale of your project is about two petabytes. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's what we were forecasting. Right, okay. So, and, and we're about 50% of the way done, too. We started this, I think, in earnest in July of 2018. Yeah. So the scale is enormous here. And essentially what we'll do at that point is load it into the autoloader, 
<clears throat> there's a product called Black Pearl, which is basically, I like to call it a uh, kind of a digital preservation tool, if you will. And essentially, it manages, it's a gateway between you know, interfaces and sources and your targets or destinations. In other words, uh, it's the data mover and the gateway to, you know, tape storage, to cloud storage, to on-prem storage, if you will, and all that sort of stuff. Once we've loaded all the data into the uh, tape library and it's managed by the Black Pearl, then through a browser, a user will actually grab the data that they want and move that to what we call tier one storage. It's fast, high-speed editorial storage that all of the video editors can work off of. And from there, if I can see, at that point, what we do then is we'll run it through Telestream Vantage, which is a tool, a, work, a workflow and transcoding uh, appliance that will actually transcode, it, transcode the files into 10 megabit H.264 files. Those then get uplifted into the cloud into an AWS account or bucket that is managed by uh, Veritone that we'll talk about in just a moment. And from there, We'll actually then um, run some cognitive workflows on that and try to get you know, our speech to text sort of transcriptions, our facial recognition. Um, we can do OCR and all sorts of other stuff. And the end game at some point will be that we're gonna bring that back into an on-prem workflow where we have asset management so that all of this rich metadata that Veritone is capturing for us gets loaded into asset management so the editor can now just search for you know, home run, Willie Mays catch, you know, this particular year, that particular game, and there's the file, right? And um, you don't have enough manpower. What was the calculation for how many people and Well, I think we said hours? 13 for a year working 40 hours a week straight through, but I think that we probably need more people. <laughs> I think so, right, right. So, um, so that's where we're now we're going to leverage the tool set and what, what the benefits of what AI can bring to us, so. Um, I think one, one thing to note is you know, there are, some people are very binary in their opinion on leaving my content on-prem or is it okay to take a proxy versions and move it to the cloud, okay? Um, we're at a point now where we don't really care. So if you're looking at indexing your content and you want to do it on an on-prem environment, we can deploy a lot of the AI models on-prem so the content doesn't even have to leave. Um, if you are okay with going to the cloud, obviously speed and scalability is easier to maintain in the cloud. Um, but as you touched on right there, we're not talking about necessarily moving the original high-res high files. We're talking we create proxy versions of it, right? So there's some level of security there. But again, you can get a lot of the same quality metadata from a proxy file versus having going back to the very original source. So wherever you plan on running cognition and introducing the AI layer, um, we can obviously work through you through groups like Cunning Engine and Alt Systems. It's my turn, huh? Um, so, so I, I think it's it's definitely important to note that um, that this this project it, it grew grew pretty quickly. Like I was saying before, we were just throwing a tape in every now and then. Intern would log it, um, but the reason why all these players need to be involved is we had so much content coming in at just breakneck speeds. And unfortunately, and fortunately enough, we started this project at a time when. We lost a Hall of Famer, Willie McCovey passed away, Frank Robinson passed away, one of our owners passed away. Um, we have next year, we're celebrating 20 years at, at Oracle Park. And we also, this, this last year, we had our 1989 team reunion. So we had a lot of cool opportunities to, to leverage this content and get it out there. I mean, while we're all here is the streaming. Uh, so we had a lot of opportunities to get it out there and engage our fan base with, with some cool stories that they had, they had never seen before. And I, th I guess that really speaks to that last bullet point there, because what you also have to remember while we're talking about streaming, we still have a big video board in our center field that we have to uh, entertain our fans and create an experience for them. Um, and, and all this content obviously gets leveraged. Give you uh, highlight 1989, we, we brought the team in um, for a reunion. We were able to go back through a lot of those game tapes and pull old commercials and got sponsors like Coke or whoever uh, to agree to allowing us to play these old 89 commercials. So then that way, you know, the, we, we altered the game experience to kind of be a throwback back to 1989. And a lot of that was obviously leveraged because we had the, the go ahead, the green light to, to make this project executable. I think, I think um, the number of use cases, and we'll just kind of wrap up in a couple minutes here, is you know, how do you get more yield? I mean, you're making an investment digitizing all this. You're making an investment of running cognition and creating that metadata, metadata layer. 
I mean, there's so many use cases um, once you have that insight. Um, we're talking obviously heavily about search and discovery, right? Surfacing great content that fits, you know, a fan base. Um, targeted advertising is a big one, right? What's inside the content? How do I associate relevant Coca-Cola ads with the right type of content at the right time? So again, the value of digitizing it, the value of putting it to addressable and scalable cloud, the value of indexing it with quality, highly accurate metadata affords you the ability to do a lot or serve a lot of different use cases cost effectively, All right? So, you, you know, I'll just do a, a unsolicited plug for uh, Paul here that, you know, what a service he's done, right? 60 years was about to get lost here. And fortunately, he had the vision and the, and the foresight to actually say, let's preserve all of this content. So thank you, Paul, for that, right? Future generations are going to love you. Yeah, hopefully. It'll be, it'll be instead of uh, McCovey Cove, it'll be uh, Paul Hodges Cove, right? I don't think that'll happen, but I appreciate it. Safe. Any other, qu any quick questions? We have a few minutes. Yeah, I got Third is that what might have been okay then is not okay now or vice versa. So has anyone talked to you about that use case? Yeah, you that one? Please, yeah. That's a pretty popular use case. So um, many different ways of doing that. Uh, obviously, the if you talk about brand safety or objectionable material, whether it's sexual in nature or profanity. I mean, you go back. We're doing a lot of work with the NFL films, and some of these interviews are awesome but highly inappropriate for today's consumption. Um, but you, so it, you really need to come up with rule sets. And so let's just hypothetically say I have a lexicon of keywords and phrases that I think are objectionable today. Whether I'm getting those from the IAB standard, right, for brand safety, you can import those and build a model. And if systematically run through all the content, pulling out where those key you know, objectionable keywords, uh, keywords and phrases may be. Um, f physical attributes, right? Nudity. I mean, all these things now you can track, like with machines, to quickly surface those up. Now, everything has a level of accuracy, right? So you can. I like to say is what AI today is really good at is greatly augmenting the human effort and making it much more efficient. But again, if, you, if this is up to your job, submitting a piece of content that may have one um, slang word in it that isn't appropriate, you know, you do, there will be a human in the loop layer at some point. But you've made the process incredibly efficient. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Just quick follow. What was the order of magnitude in terms of the cost savings that you realized? Uh, getting into this whole project, um, I, I guess the cost savings. I, I don't really know how to answer, answer that other than I, I guess we, we kind of approach this as a big, I was given a big check to, to have this done. Luckily our owner took this as a as more of a nostalgic, emotional, um, let's save this stuff and, 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 and he really believed in just preserving it as well as allowing us to have the access to it. Um, so I was fortunate enough that it wasn't kind of giving rails to, to try to find ways to be so cost effective, but uh, I think one, bringing in an AI partner rather than also having interns sit there and log stuff, which, I mean, I was an intern logging way back in the days too, and I wouldn't trust myself versus what we're getting from a machine that I think that other slide said, you know, our entire library could be done in one month versus an entire year. Um, but I, I, I guess the, the project kind of grew in scope, as I, I said earlier, just it, it got big. We didn't realize how many layers and everything we needed to think through, uh, which is why we have a big team. It's not just me up here talking about it. Yeah, and, and the ROI isn't figured out yet. It's still to be determined, right? So that, in other words, we've done all the work now, but now we have 60 years of legacy documented and preserved. We can monetize that and take advantage of that, um, you know, for the next you know, 100 years, right? And I, I think there's cost savings, and then what's the opportunity to generate right. revenue? Right, so there's two two factors. For example, CBS News, sim very similar project. We've only even digitized two percent of their entire historical index library. Right now, the yield we're able to get just with that two percent is pretty substantial. Obviously, this is the 50th an anniversary of the moon landing, and you can sort of parlay that into opportunities. So I challenge people to think of if you have that quality, accurate index, 
don't just look at the potential cost savings against manual human labor, but what's the revenue potential as well. I think you need to look at both factors. Yeah, oh, that's a great point, because that's what we're trying to figure out now. Other, other sponsors that we can layer in, or just, yeah. as I said earlier, impacting the fan experience is a huge piece, too, <coughs> trying to draw people into the uh, ballparks. Um, a, a little. I mean, we haven't introduced it to them, but you know, finding um, a score bug, any type of derivative of a score bug where it shows up, there's, simply, there's models now that can quickly find, even if it hasn't been pre-trained on like the look and feel of a score box, whether it's a digital overlay or it's actually in the background in the footage itself. So that's an example of models you can deploy. Um, motion, I, I would say, is still in the works. Um, so there's literally, there's a challenge um, for us to say, I mean, baseball is interesting. I mean, a, a plaza, uh, you know, a, a boring home run doesn't get a lot of airtime. I want a spectacular home run where it's a full extension. So you look at the, the basically the angles, right, between your shoulder, your elbow, to your wrist. And so there's, there's a lot of things they're doing in football that are going to automate those things. That all being said, most conservatively is, is just look at um, numbers, like logos, you know, and, and elements like that is the, probably the most consistent. But there are a ton of companies and startups that are trying to come up with models. And just a little plug, if, you, if they do have a model, you can plug it right in. They don't even have to change their stack working with Veritone. That if somebody comes up with that model, they can add it post-fact and in, into their stack and then rerun their content on, at a cost-effective basis. And, and I would only say this project is unique where a lot of it is old game tapes where probably some of that data isn't needed um, and documentary content and, and all this other kind of footage where that kind of level of smarts isn't really needed on this project per se, but unless like looking forward and we wanted to kind of, you know, impact the, the fan experience today with what game is happening tonight, I think that's where it starts to get cool. Yeah, so uh, I'll I'll go backwards, I guess. No, uh, so so sixty years. That's basically because that's the oldest asset we had. Uh, baseball, as you saw on there, we I think the Giants were very progressive in the '80s. That they had Giants Vision, and that kind of led to Sports Channel, and and they they start to own their own rights and broadcast their own games. So we, that's where we have a lot of footage in the '80s. Baseball in general, I think their library kind of starts in earnest in the '90s. Um, so we go back a little bit, but the because there are so many games, it was less frequent of having a lot of content. So there's there's films scattered throughout here, the years that make up that 60 year. So that home run, yeah, we, we have that obviously on, on film in there. So that, I mean, that's where it goes back. Um, but I, I think one of your other questions was related to Yeah, so that's where a lot of this content gets leveraged is in those kind of examples or when a player comes back or we, we hold reunions. Uh, so in my world, it's basically filling content for our social channels as well as our game entertainment. We have a relationship with our RSN and our broadcaster, but um, it'll take a little bit before they can obviously get in there and start start using it, I guess, as I'm thinking, like the, you, your interface in the web app aspect yeah, of it. A, a they division, could pull that stuff a division of Veritone is, it's called Veritone Digital. So if you watch the end of Sports Center, for example, you'll see the credits. So 
um, like the Masters, uh, the U.S. Open, SEC football, NCAA, they come to our gateway, the same one they're using, and that's where they pick up their content. So as if you have the rules, if you have the contract, um, like Yahoo Sports or somebody to go ac access that content, they're actually using the same digital media hub platform that, they, that they're using internally to pull that editorial content specifically, specifically for those shows or forms of engagement. But to answer your question, yes, we're going to leverage this stuff for the scoreboard, for storytelling, for just you know nostalgic purposes uh, on our social channels and in park. Uh, for the film, uh, so so I think that example was just for film, and I think we. We, uh, we chose 2K because of, the, of where the resolution was of the 16 millimeter. It just wasn't as cost effective to go to 4K. Uh, it was going to add a lot. Um, and we weren't going to pick up much more data from that 16 millimeter film, which is why we chose 2K. So I think that example, that flow was essentially for a film. Yeah, it's, it's 2048 by 1556, which fits the form factor of like 35 millimeter film and that sort of stuff. So it was a logical choice. But I think thir 30 amount of data too. You know, we want to be um, you know, not overshoot in terms of you know, 4K resolution is going to take up a lot more space too, a lot more real estate. It just wasn't needed. Did you do any color correction or image enhancements of the old quad stuff and you know, kind of 60s-ish bad color TV? Was there any imaging sharpening enhancements done with the AI? Not with the AI. That part was done actually by a person at Iron Mountain. Um, essentially, there are so there are there are, I think beta tapes. There are three quarter inch were probably the most tapes we had. Film. It's going to take this one guy who does the whole thing a year and a half to go through all our films, to scan them, color correct, and then and then send them along in in their file format. So one guy is actually going through there and and taking care of all that stuff by hand. I think we're out of time, but I appreciate everybody coming today. Hope you have a safe drive Thank home. You. Thank you.